many of you here tonight have an angel story to tell? How many don't have an angel story to tell? I hope you'll have one to tell before too long. Just now I'd like to tell you a couple of my angel stories. Angels are so very real and so personally in our midst. That is one thing that is absolutely certain and I can bear witness to that. Aside from being saved from so many near-death experiences and accidents that I had as a child, the one that I would like to tell you about this evening happened when I was 18. 18 was a turning point in my life. I was leaving home, going to college. I knew I'd be on my way and finding my way in the world. I was looking for my path. I had studied metaphysics since my early childhood. I was very serious about pursuing God. And every moment I had, I would take my Bible, go to my room, and ponder the words of Jesus. And as I read those words, and I would commune with my Lord, he would say in my heart, everything that I have taught is not there. And when I would listen to the ministers preach on Sunday, Jesus would say in my heart, everything that I have taught is not there. By and by, as I grew older, I came to realize that Jesus was gently nudging me in the direction of writing about his lost teachings and his lost years. This I have done. Not until the Nag Hammadi texts were discovered in 1945 did we have the full revelation of what the Gnostics were all about and what they believed. One thing is certain, they also believed in angels. So this was a turning point for me. I had found the Christian Science Church when I was a child, and it taught me more about God and myself and Jesus than I could learn anywhere else. But I had a great affinity for the Catholic Church, and I used to pull my mother in and ask her if I could light a candle and kneel before the Blessed Mother, even while Protestants and those in metaphysics were telling me that that was a very terrible thing that Catholics did. They worshipped the mother of Jesus and we should not worship idols. And so all of these things were coming at me from different sides. So this was one bright Sunday morning when I came out of church and was on the front steps of the Christian Science Church in Red Bank. Red Bank, Red Bank New Jersey, my hometown. And whenever I went to church, I always came out feeling filled with the light of God not exactly always being able to translate the meaning of that light, but I had been infilled with light and it was always a glorious time for me. And so as I was standing in the sunlight, I was taken aback because I was not expecting to see an angel, much less an archangel standing before me. It was Archangel Gabriel. I knew it as I knew my own soul. He allowed me to see him by quickening my inner sight, which was not really developed at that time. I felt his powerful presence, and I felt my mind lock into the mind of God through Gabriel's intercession. He made me feel as though it was altogether natural. I was having a conversation with him, and at the same time, I was one with God. It was as though he transmitted to me a message from God spherically. That's the only way I can describe it. It was a sphere of all-knowingness, of self-knowing, fused with my own sense of self-awareness in God. As I look back upon it, I realize that this was made possible through the rings upon rings of the aura of Archangel Gabriel. They seem to serve as an antenna, stepping down a communication from a very high plane to my level. In the split second it took for me to receive the higher awareness that Gabriel conveyed, I heard myself say out loud, why, I have to make my ascension in this life. He put that awareness and understanding inside of me although no one had ever taught me that any of us 
should be making our ascension besides Jesus Christ. I was astounded that the words came out of my mouth. And for a second I knew that I had experienced this all-knowing mind of God that my Sunday school teachers talked about all the time. The interchange couldn't have taken more than 60 seconds, but I was suspended somewhere else. I had glimpsed heaven and Archangel Gabriel. That one glimpse would carry me for a lifetime until my cup and my mission were full. None of my Sunday school teachers had ever explained to me that the scriptural account of the ascension of Jesus Christ is an example of an initiation that is open and ordained for every one of God's sons and daughters. But in that moment, I knew it. And no one could take from me that inner knowing. I knew it because the aura of Archangel Gabriel had surrounded me and his God consciousness had conveyed to me the reality of the soul's union with God through the ascension. As I look back on that moment and all the other people that were around me who would have rejected, hands down, one and all, such a notion that I had just perceived, it's really amazing to me that although I was a part of Orthodox Christianity, I was receptive to a thought transfer from the mind of an archangel telling me precisely why I was here and what I was to accomplish. Even though Christian science was a part of the metaphysical movement of the 19th century, from where I stand today it seemed to be an orthodox religion in that its hierarchy denies all possibility of progressive revelation since Mary Baker Eddy, who passed on in about 1908, 1910. Progressive revelation, of course, has never ended because Jesus Christ and the angels and the apostles and the saints in heaven have never stopped talking with us. And so the Bible isn't a closed book, it is an open book. And Jesus can and does speak to us and he sends his holy angels to speak to us. And so I knew it then, and I know it now, that the ascension is the goal for your life. And I knew then that this was a message I had to tell the whole world, everyone and anyone who would listen, because I saw that there were people all over the world who were ready for that acceleration, who could graduate from Earth's schoolroom in this life, but who needed the rest of Jesus' teachings that had been lost or deliberately left out or taken from us through the persecution of the Gnostics. I knew that Jesus had taught that through his heart we could reach God. But the church taught I had to go through a priest or this one or that one in order to get to God. So I realized then and I'm telling you now that not only do the archangels teach you how to attain that goal but the Ascended Masters also teach you how to attain that goal. What is an Ascended Master? An Ascended Master is someone just like you or me. They've done two things that we haven't accomplished yet. They have become the masters of themselves, their minds, their emotions, their lives, and they have balanced at least 51% of their karma. As a result of that, they have accelerated into higher dimensions of light, they have passed through the ritual of the ascension, hence the term ascended master. We are in a schoolroom, and some of us feel that it's pretty well time that we ought to be moving along, graduating, that there's another schoolroom waiting where we can be challenged, that we're ready for. How do we get from here to there? The ascension is the process, and the ascension itself has steps that must be taken. This is a very important handbook on the Ascension. It was dictated by the Ascended Master who is in charge of training us in the path of the Ascension, Serapis Bay. It's called a dossier on the Ascension. If this rings a bell, if the Ascension process and graduation from Earth's schoolroom rings a bell for you, pick it up and read it.
Many years after my experience with Archangel Gabriel, I took the opportunity while I was in Boston to ask my Christian Science teacher about the Ascension, wanting to know what was the ultimate doctrine that Christian scientists teach on the subject. Well, to, I, to my amazement, he just passed it off as something that automatically happens at the conclusion, at the conclusion of a life that is lived in God. But I knew better. I know that the ascension doesn't just happen. We have to define it as a goal and we have to understand how to get there. It doesn't happen just because you're a good person, as he assured me it did. There are requirements and initiations. The soul has to pass through the trial by fire, that is, the sacred fire of God. And then there is the lifelong challenge of karma, dealing with our karma. Gabriel tells fathers and mothers to be at the soul level when it is time to conceive and bring forth children. He instructs our souls as to how we can walk the path of the ascension as well. In all of these announcements that he makes to us, he has been called the Angel of the Annunciation. He tells us that every child of God is destined to return to God through the ritual of the Ascension. And he will communicate to you through your mind or through your heart, through a certain inner impelling, that this is the goal of your life. He tells us that the right of the Ascension is not reserved for the few. He teaches us how to walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, how to balance our karma, and how to serve to set life free. Gabriel teaches us that if we follow the spiritual path and invoke the violet flame, which I'm going to talk to you about in a moment, we can ascend at the end of this life, unless severe karma dictates a final embodiment after this one in which we would be required to balance our remaining karma. So the teachings of the path are that if we take up the violet flame and use it and apply it, if we make an about face and walk toward the sun of the living presence of God, if we are willing to undo the wrongs we have done, if we are willing to call upon the law of forgiveness for those we have wronged that we might send to them a gift of fire from our hearts for healing, and also ask for forgiveness for all who have wronged us. If we can make our peace with every part of life, sow good works and undo the wrong we have done, we will be moving toward that goal at the conclusion of this life. My encounter with Archangel Gabriel sent me on a relentless course to know God face to face. I had come that close to Gabriel Moses had communed with God on the mountain, so had Jesus Christ, Zoroaster, Krishna, Gautama Buddha, Confucius, and many of their disciples. I knew that everyone in this world had the right to talk to his God, one-on-one, -on -one, face to face, and there was a burning desire in my heart to tell everyone that very story. It doesn't matter what you've done, who you've been. It doesn't matter what sins you have committed. God will take all of that and let the flame of the Holy Spirit pass through it. You are the beloved of God this day. Don't accept the condemnation of the world or of death and hell. And don't accept the label that you are a, mid a miserable sinner and can never overcome that state of sinfulness. You may have sinned, but you are not sinners. I am here to tell you that you are children of God, sons and daughters of God, and in you dwells that living Atman, that higher self. Call it the inner Christ, the inner Buddha. It's the inner light. That is your true identity. You do not consist of all the wrongs you have done or all the rights you have done. You are made of God's stuff. And that spirit of the living God is upon you and in you and focus through your chakras and the angels are here to tell you about it, to quicken you and to accelerate the light that you already have and to give you more. Well, I'm going to tell you one more of my angel stories because this is a continuation of the one I just told you. That wasn't the first time I had experienced angels. 
The following scene I will never forget. I was water skiing down the Navasink River, going out toward the sea, toward the sea. It was a beautiful day, one of those gorgeous days on the East Coast with blue skies and fluffy clouds. And I transcended my physical consciousness as I was water skiing and entered into another dimension. I'm certain that was so because all I could think about was God and his angels and the glory and his light so present in the earth that I couldn't wait to find out about and make contact with. So amidst the blue sky and the billowy clouds, I did see the angels of God. I was transported. I felt my soul and my pulse quicken. Now I knew what the Bible phrase meant, a multitude of the heavenly host. There they were. I could see souls from many centuries who were rejoicing with me and that in this age, all of our bands, yes, all of you, all of us together, would have the opportunity to attain union with God. I saw that these were my friends, brothers, sisters, spiritual companions. I was not alone in my quest. I had known them forever. These were cohorts of light from past ages. They were joining me. They were cheering me on. I was not afraid. For the words of the prophets I had treasured in Sunday school were all the reassurance I needed. As God said to Jeremiah, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Thus the angel of the Lord had commissioned Jeremiah. The angel of the Lord has commissioned each and every one of you at some point in your life, perhaps in the deepest recesses of your soul, perhaps in a memory that is too far back to quite quicken. But you have been called to whatever you are to do in this life as surely as Jeremiah was called for his mission. In that moment, I knew also that I was called and that my Lord would make known to me the particulars of my calling in this life. In 1961, God did call me to be a messenger for the archangels and the ascended masters. The master El Moria trained me the Master Saint Germain ordained and anointed me to deliver the word of God in the tradition of the Hebrew prophets. But it was Mark Prophet, my late husband, who had received his training ten years before me, who was my tutor in the flesh. He drilled me day after day for three years in the rigors of El Moria's and Saint Germain's discipline. I count this very personal instruction under the Masters and Mark as the greatest blessing I have ever known. Without it, I would not have been ready to deal with the challenges I have faced throughout my mission. Mark and I have taken hundreds of dictations from the archangels. I will be quoting from them throughout this seminar. You know, it's a funny thing, but many people ask me, well, what was your training all about? And they always think that I was trained to take a dictation. Well, that is the last thing one is trained to do because really there is no training to receive the dictations from God through the Holy Spirit. What I was trained in was in the work of Thomas the Kempis, the imitation of Christ. I was trained in how to subdue pride and all of the other vices that we are heir to, how to give the comforting word how not to talk down to people or belittle people or be disdainful, not to utter anything that would tear from a living soul that sense of the presence of God. I was taught the disciplining of the emotions, the mind. El Moria is somewhat of a Zen master, and he teaches in riddles, and he teaches with great intensity of fire. There were certain books I read but what finally came to my heart as the point where I could be trustworthy to bear this mantle in this lifetime was the putting together of a path of love and discipline 
of understanding the difference between pride and humility, boldness in the Lord, and an absolute tenderness toward every part of life. This training goes on through a lifetime. I had to deal with severe tests of karma as well as initiations. Would I or would I not make the right choice when given five or ten choices that all seemed right? I am grateful to be able to be speaking to you this evening. This evening it is twenty years since Mark Prophet took his leave of me. We spent twelve years together and had four children and now have seven grandchildren. Those twelve years were the richest that I can remember of any lifetime. They were for the enriching of my soul and the stripping of my being of that which is simply not acceptable unto God. I think that this training has done for me a most profound transformation and I am profoundly grateful to have received it. This is the kind of training that I in turn give to anyone who wants to receive it. As much as you would like to receive the fire of the Archangels and the Ascended Masters, I am always ready to impart it. We have Summit University eight-week seminars every summer, and you're most welcome to come. So now let's proceed in earnest as we explore together how you can contact angels, for they truly are your guides, guardians, and friends. Very first step, develop a listening ear. Turn off the TV set, turn off the noise, don't keep your mind saturated with either reading the news or, or always having information coming at you from without. Have a certain time of the day where your house is silent, even if it's before you retire at night, where you can feel yourself going into the inner ear and listening to God, and in preparation for hearing Him, give the prayers that you are comfortable with, prayers your mother taught you, your father taught you. Pray to God and his angels. Have an open ear and you will begin to hear direction in your life. You also listen with a listening heart. So the word angel comes from the Latin angelus, meaning messenger. Angels are God's messengers whom he has sent to minister to us as our guides, guardians, and friends. The author of Hebrews tells us that God maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. God fashioned angels out of his own flaming spirit. He made them be extensions of his presence so that he could dwell with us through his angelic retinue. Every angel that comes to your house is an extension of God. God's presence in your house. Isn't that a beautiful gift? Our Father, Mother, God could not bear to leave us alone in this dense world called the footstool kingdom. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation, says the author of Hebrews. Yet God did not put the rulership of the world to come under his angels, but under the Son of God. God reserved that rulership to his son, the living Christ. And we'll get to that in a moment. Each and every angel who comes knocking on your door from the least to the greatest is the receptacle, the repository of a special grace or gift that God himself is sending to you marked personal with your name on it. When you open your heart and your door to an angel, be ready to be filled with a sacred essence from God formulated especially for you. Angels have a multitude of offices and functions that are divided among the heavenly hierarchies ruled by the seven archangels. The angels are divided into nine choirs. The choirs are grouped into three hierarchies. A choir is not just a group that sings. A choir is a division or a classification of angels according to the service they render. So the first hierarchy is composed of the choirs of seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. The second hierarchy is composed of the dominions, or dominations, 
the virtues, and the powers. Each one of those names is the name of a whole hierarchy of millions upon millions of angels. The third hierarchy is composed of the principalities, the archangels, and the angels. Each choir or division has a different office. These are described by scholar Geddes McGregor. One, seraphim. Following the biblical description in Isaiah, seraphim are shown with six wings and flames of fire around them, for they are fiery spirits. They may bear a shield emblazoned with the words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. There's a particular slide of Gustave Doré that shows the rings of angels around the great central sun. And this can give you a sense of the infinite number of angels. The seraphim of God actually form rings of light around the throne of glory. And they go in cycles out to the farthermost reaches of our universe to bring that light to the various planetary systems and to minister to the people. And so these millions and millions of angels go out, give all the light they've garnered from the central sun and then go home for a recharge during which time they are circling the great central sun and then they go out again. I'm sure that God must have given Gustave Doré a vision of the angels. As you see it is surely the great, great multitude of the extensions of God. Number two, the cherubim are frequently depicted with multi-eyed peacock's feather to symbolize their all-knowing character. Three, the thrones are represented as wheels of fire. They are the throne bearers of God, symbolizing the divine majesty. Four, the dominations carry scepter and sword to symbolize the divine power over all creation. The virtues carry the instruments of the passion of Christ. The powers carry a flaming sword because they are protectors of humankind. The principalities are the protectors of princes and usually carry sword, scepter, and cross. Thomas Aquinas defines divisions eight and nine. The archangels, he says, are those angels who carry to man the most solemn messages entrusted to them by God. Archangels are the captains or hierarchs of the angelic hosts. They preside over the seven rays. An archaea is the feminine complement of an archangel. Archaea is the singular noun. Archaei is the plural noun. Archangels are also emanations of God. In fact, they are the direct extension of God's being. They embody the fullness of the presence of God. Think then of the manifest presence of the one God as the great central sun, the hub of light at the nexus of the spirit matter cosmos. I don't think we are even in a position on our planet to see this center and hub. Many, many years ago, God revealed this center to me, and I could hear the hum, the hum of light, and the hum of the presence of this great central sun. And I understood that this sun was a nexus just like the nexus in a figure eight, whereby in the very center, the energies would go over the pattern of a figure eight, and that point was the point of the converging of the spirit cosmos and the matter cosmos. If you think of the Tai Chi, the great symbol of Taoism, of the two halves of the whole, this is representative of the plus and the minus, the spirit matter cosmos, or the father mother God. So this blazing, dazzling central sun that is so vast that we cannot even have a sense of co-measurement with it, out from it come shafts of sunlight. And these shafts of light, as it were, become angel forms as they descend to earth. Yes, as the sunbeam is to the sun, so are angels the extensions of the living presence of God. And the greatest of these are the archangels and the archaei. Therefore, when you stand in the presence of an archangel or an archaea, you are standing in the presence of God. You're watching Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and founder of Summit University. Summit University is located at the beautiful Royal Teton Ranch in Park County, Montana, just north of Yellowstone National Park. If you'd like more information, call 1-800-245-5445. That's 
245-5445. Archangels are God's architects. God uses them to draft the plans for his projects and to execute them. They are cosmic builders and designers in the grandest sense of the word. They arc to our minds the divine blueprint for every endeavor, every effort, even your child's model airplane. Remember that the archangels are available for the smallest and the least assignment you have to the greatest. I'd like to show you now the chart of the presence so you can see the relationship of the archangels to the great causal body. There are seven rays and the archangels serve on those rays. So the first ray is Archangel Michael, the prince of the archangels. His archaea is named Faith and the color of this archangel is a brilliant royal blue. So that royal blue corresponds to the outermost ring of the upper figure in the chart. This chart has three figures. The upper ch figure represents the individualized presence of God, the middle figure, your higher self, your real self, and the lower figure is a picture of yourself standing in the violet flame of the Holy Spirit. So there are seven rays to that upper sphere, which is like a cross section of a complete sphere, and there are seven corresponding chakras. So if you look at the chart behind me for the causal body, I'm going to show in this screen yourself as the lower figure, which we call the chakra man. And it shows you where your chakras are superimposed over the physical body. If these chakras correspond to the seven rays. God has placed chakras, or they are called spiritual centers in your body, as the place where you store light and where you hold light and where you hold energy. So we are on the blue ray, the first ray of Archangel Michael. On the causal body behind me, you see it is the outermost sphere corresponding to the blue chakra, which is the throat chakra, the power of the spoken word and the power of speech. Blue is the color of power, of government, of perfection, and of protection. The day we feel this energy the most is Tuesday. Now we, we look at the second ray. If you look at the causal body above me, you will see the second ray is the yellow ray. It is closest to the center. It surrounds the white light. And on the chakra man, it is the crown chakra. The crown chakra is the chakra of illumination and of wisdom. It is yellow. We feel this most on Sunday. The name of the archangel is Jophiel, and his archaea is Christine. This is the action of the tingling at the crown that you can feel during meditation. And later on in this lecture, I'm going to give you a meditation where you can begin to feel the activation of that chakra by the tingling of light. The archangel and archaea of the third ray our Archangel Chamuel and Charity. Their band is the third band that you see on the causal body. It is pink. We feel that energy most on Monday and it corresponds to the heart chakra, the real intense feeling of love in the heart. When you have love in your heart, the angels will multiply that love many times over and your love becomes the abiding place for the living Christ, the living Buddha, to reach out to all whom you meet. So your heart center is the place where you sow the works of love. The fourth ray, Archangel Gabriel and the Archaea Hope. That is the base of the spine chakra. The ray is white. You see at the base of the spine the white chakra. And then it is the center core of the causal body that you see behind me, the white. The white flame is the flame of the ascension. It is the flame of the Divine Mother. It is the sacred fire that rises and nourishes each of the chakras as it ascends up that spinal cord. And that is a cord of light. It's called the crystal cord. If you look on the chart behind me, you see the crystal cord descending from the presence of God and entering the head at the point where you see it on the screen. So that is the power of procreation, the power of creativity. And when that energy rises on the spinal altar, it stimulates 
all the other chakras and causes you to be creative at all seven levels. Of course, when that energy is squandered, there is nothing left to rise, and so people are not so creative when they do not conserve that life force. The fifth ray is Archangel Raphael and the Blessed Mother Mary. She's called the Queen of Angels and the Mother of Jesus Christ. How did she come to be an archangel or an archaea, a twin flame of an archangel? Well, she actually always was an archaea. And what happened is that the Father, Mother, God called Raphael and the Blessed Mary to them in the great central sun and announced to them that Mary would take on physical embodiment, would embody on earth, would be the mother of the Savior Jesus Christ, and that Raphael would remain in heaven to guard her and to guard Jesus. They accepted the assignment and of course the parting is always difficult when the, the twin flames that are in heaven when one must go forth and one must remain. So Mother Mary did come forth and she did perform her service. It took an archaei to have the power and the attainment to guard the infant Jesus and so Mary did keep that flame and keep that communion for him. And so this is the green band inside the blue of the causal body. It is green, it is most active on Wednesday, and it corresponds to the third eye or the inner eye chakra right at the brow. You see that it is green. On the sixth ray are Archangel Uriel and the Archaea Aurora. Their band is purple and gold. It corresponds to the fifth ray and the solar plexus chakra. Your solar plexus is just at the navel. You see the green band is inside the blue and the purple and gold is inside the green. Most active on Thursday. The seventh ray is Archangel Zadkiel and the Archaea Holy Amethyst. This corresponds to the seat of the soul chakra. It is the violet ray and the violet flame most active on Saturday. And you can see that violet. It's a pinker violet on the chart just on the other side of the pink. The seat of the soul chakra is between the base chakra and the solar plexus. You can see that violet chakra. And that is actually where your soul resides in your body. That is actually where your soul is fastened, if you want to put it that way. Now that's an interesting thing because anybody involved in the martial arts knows that that is also the center point of key of the real fire of the body and the fire that is the ability to perform in the martial arts and really to do anything in life. We need that key and we need it concentrated for all creative actions. So those are your chakras and what the archangels do is when you pray whatever prayers are comfortable for you of your church or your background or mantras or when you do yoga and exercise the angels can nourish the chakras and replenish them and increase the light in your temple. People say it's all about power. Well, what it's really all about is light. And light is power. The light that you carry in you is that which energizes your form. You are enabled thereby to resist diseases and illnesses. The light that you carry gives you the energy in your body to accomplish your mission and your divine plan. So there are many ways of squandering our light. And one of the ways that light goes out from us is just by putting our attention on so many, many things in the world and forgetting for a few moments, even 15 minutes a day, to put our attention on God. When you keep your attention on God, that means you have opened a track through the third eye, through your heart, through devotion, through the inner seeing, you've actually opened a highway to that great central sun. And over that highway, you send your devotion. And God receives that devotion, multiplies it, and sends it back to you as nourishment, spiritual nourishment for your body. Thomas Aquinas defines the angels as the guardians of men, the messengers of God who deliver communications of lesser importance. Angels, that is, as opposed to archangels who bring very solemn messages. 
My interaction with them has shown that they tend our bodies, console our spirits, invigorate our minds, and restore our souls. They deliver to us God's word and his intercessory works. Angels of the Holy Spirit convey God's prophecies and warnings, his comfort and enlightenment and his exhortations and spiritual admonishments. I want to point out to you that your soul has a great deal of knowing that your outer mind does not have. Our outer mind has been educated to uh, sharpen the intellect, sharp, sharpen the cognitive procedures. But the intuitive part of the brain, the intuitive part of the soul, is not quickened. I want you to make it a point of listening to your soul, listening and feeling your gut reaction to people, to situations. You will get that message from your angel through your soul most of the time only once. It is soft, it is there, it is clear. But if something comes along afterwards that's louder, someone is trying to convince you otherwise and take you in a different direction, you say to yourself, well, maybe I really didn't hear that. Maybe that was my imagination. Maybe I really didn't get that impulse. You need to be willing to listen to your soul as a point of communication. And then you need to be listening to your higher self as another level of communication and then you need to be listening to angels. God has provided many ways whereby he can communicate us at different levels and through different channels. We all know very well, if we're not tuned into the right channel, we don't get our program. We don't see what we're supposed to see. Tuning into the right wavelength and vibration comes by the giving of prayers and mantras. Paul was inspired by his own direct encounter with the angels, and he gave us this reminder, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Now we arrive at the question, who is the Son of God? What is his relationship to the angels? The author of Hebrews writes, what is man that thou art mindful of him? or the son of man that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and it set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that by the grace of God should taste death for every man. You see, because Jesus was born of the flesh, it is said that he was made a little lower than the angels, because prior to that great rebellion of Lucifer, the angels had never descended to the lowly estate of the flesh. They had never occupied bodies of flesh such as we wear. So at that time, all the angels of heaven worshiped the Son of God. They ministered unto him in all of their various capacities and callings from God. So Hebrews continues, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. I always love this term from Hebrews. Hebrews calls Jesus the captain of our salvation. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. The author of Hebrews, and nobody knows who authored the book of Hebrews, by the way, but the author of Hebrews seems to know very well that when Jesus sanctifies us, we are then no different from Jesus for he has given us the sanctification of himself. And that is why Jesus calls us his brothers and sisters. Jesus has made us his equals. And that is what the author of Hebrews believes. He believes that the very fact that Jesus called us brethren establishes you and me as Jesus' equals. Equal in opportunity, equal in inner resources, equal in the ability to walk in his footsteps, 
and perform the same works that he performed. That's why Jesus gave us the promise himself. He that believeth in me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. We don't hear many ministers telling us that we should do the works that Jesus did. But Jesus told us that, and that means all of the works, all the way to the resurrection and the ascension. Because Jesus raised the sons and daughters of God to be his equals, Paul was able to tell the Corinthians, Know ye not that we shall judge angels. And that means the fallen angels. So when Jesus Christ had fulfilled his final incarnation on earth and ascended to the throne of grace, then he was crowned with glory and honor above all the angels of heaven. And once again, because Jesus, the captain of our salvation, chose to make each of us his own when we fulfill our final incarnation on earth, we will also ascend to heaven. This is the true logic of this scripture. Now I would like to show you the mystery of our relationship to the Son of God and the angels as it is revealed in this chart of your divine self. Who is the Son of God? The Son of God is the living Christ. What does Christ mean? Christos. It is from the Greek. It means anointed, one who is anointed with the light. It's not exclusively a Christian term. Every avatar who has ever come in all ages has been anointed with a light. So the middle figure in the chart is the figure of Christ, the mediator, Christ who is the only begotten Son of God, full of grace and truth. Jesus showed the mystery of the breaking of the body of the Lord at the Last Supper when he took that loaf of bread and he broke it. And he gave a piece to each of his disciples and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Each piece of that loaf was the whole loaf, just as the drop of water is the whole ocean. God has given to you and to me a Christ presence, a Christ self. Every one of you in this room has that abiding, overshadowing Christ presence. How many Christs are in this room? One Christ, one universal light, one universal Christ, the higher self of each one, very personal to each and every one of us. That is that Christ presence. And one times one times one still equals one. There is only one Christ. God would not leave us alone. He revealed himself to Moses. In the bush that burned, it was not consumed. We are the bush, there is a fire burning in our breast, and that fire does not consume us because it is the spiritual fire of God, it's the divine spark. God revealed the I am that I am, figured in the upper figure in the chart. That is your I am presence, the presence of the I am that I am. Moses asked God, whom shall I say sent me when I go and tell? the children of Israel. And God said, Tell them I am hath sent you. I am. That is my name forever and my memorial to all generations. It is the key name and the key word. You want to know the key word and the magic formula? That's what it is. Religion isn't intended to be complicated. The I am presence, when we use that name I am, we are affirming the verb to be, which happens to be the name of God. It means I am who I am, I will be what I will be, you will know me in the outworking of events. You will observe me after the fact. When I perform my works, my miracles, my judgments, whatever I do, you will identify me because of what you see happening around you and in you. So that is the I am presence that is above you now. There is only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Yet God so loved us that he individualized himself personally to each one, placed his presence over us. 
so we can talk, walk and talk with our Father, Mother, God. But more than likely, we will talk to the higher self, whom we call the Holy Christ self. Because as God has said, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. So Christ is the mediator between our imperfect human self and the absolutely perfect manifestation of God, of whom Habakkuk wrote, Thou art of two pure eyes to behold iniquity. So the Christ presence knows our sins. The Christ presence mediates in our behalf before God, and that is reminiscent of the Holy of Holies and the High Priest in the Temple who stood between the people and the tremendous power of God who spoke to Moses. You have an I Am Presence. You have a Holy Christ Self. Because that Christ Self is your real self, you then are sons and daughters of God. The angels minister unto you, they bow to the light of the Christ that is in you, and they serve you because you have that potential to fully realize your Christhood, your sonship on earth. The goal of this chart is that the lower figure, through the Holy Spirit, which is the violet flame, shall become the Christ in action. Then the chart will change, and the middle figure will drop around you, and you walk the earth in the fullness of that light, that Christ presence. At the end of this life, or when you choose to make it your final embodiment, and you are going to ascend to God, in the ritual of the ascension, your soul, now wed to your Christ self, will merge fully and finally with the I Am Presence, never more to go out into these bodies. You will then walk the earth as an ascended master, and in the etheric octaves you will be seen by unascended souls and beings, and by some on earth who have that inner vision. Explaining this relationship of yourself to that Christ presence, your I am presence, and the angels really sets the stage for all of my subsequent lectures now on the angels. So one of the reasons you came here was to find out how to meet your guardian angel. And I want to tell you that your guardian angel already knows you. And he or she knows you better than anyone else in the universe. That's why he can be your guide, guardian, and friend. But I'm here to tell you that your chief guardian angel is none other than that Christ presence that is over you. That is your chief guardian angel that has never left you, that does warn you, that does speak to you in your heart, in your soul, that does give you the warnings. But what does it mean, chief guardian angel? Well, it so happens that all the rest of the seven archangels and seraphim and cherubim of God also send angels to guard you. And so your holy Christ self directs them, tells them what to do, and they, of course, take directions from you also, as long as what you tell them to do is in keeping with the will of God. It is our Holy Christ Self who sees our I Am Presence and does reflect that divine image back upon our souls. Jesus talks about this in Matthew. He talks about the angels beholding the face of the Father. He says, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man is come to save that which is lost. So there was no vernacular for chief guardian angel when the scriptures were written. But Jesus comes closest to saying it. First he says it's the angel that beholds the face of, their, of the Father. And then he says it's the Son of Man that comes to save that which was lost. So this is the Son of Man. What I've given you so far is my introduction on guardian angels and your relationship to angels, to your I Am Presence, to your Christ Self, to your soul in the seat of the soul chakra, to show you your chakras and to allow you to see how many different ways God has created to make sure that there's a two-way street of communication going. We just have to use those mechanisms 
and I will be teaching you how to use each one of these separately as we go through this seminar. For more information on how angels can make a difference in your life, call toll-free 1-800-245-5445. The preceding program was presented by Summit University, Box 5000, Livingston, Montana, 59047-5000. If you'd like to know more, call this number or write this address. For a free book on the spiritual path, call 1-800-245-5445. That's 1-800-245-5445.